Hello family, my name is Chris, I am your home gamer dad, and it's that time of year again where it feels like there's a brand new crowdfunding project popping up basically every day. And I'm not just talking about the little ones that are sprinkled out through the year and everything, I'm talking about some big name companies are putting out these big crowdfunding projects like right now around this time of year, and maybe it's just the change of seasons as like that, maybe it's tax season, who the heck knows or whatever, but what I'd like to do today is I'm calling a family meeting. This way we can all sit down and talk about what our particular criterias are for backing crowdfunding projects. What is it that you look for in a campaign that gets you to spend your hard earned money in order to back a project in order to get it a year from now? Many of you may be familiar with my Why I Backed series here on this channel and it pretty much is doing this exact thing, giving you guys an idea of what it is that I look for in particular campaigns that get me to back it. So you can probably guess what's gonna be on this list anyway, but I really just wanted to kind of give an overview of my top five reasons about why I back games, what I particularly look for in a campaign, in the companies, in the games themselves, things along that ways, in order to like trigger in my head like, okay, so I'm going to back this and this is it's gonna be awesome and I can't wait for it. So as I tell you about mine, I would love to hear from you as well. What is something that you look forward to in a campaign that gets you to put your money down? Is it the publishers that you like? Is it the particular designers of a game? Is it the way the game is, the price? You know, there's so many different bullet points of sorts that everyone looks at and everyone has a different opinion about what it is they feel should be in a campaign to get their interest, to get them to like it and everything. And it goes even beyond more of, well, I just like it because there's gotta be something more to it. Do you like the IP? Do you like the way that the games are? Things along that way. So I would love to hear about all of that and more from you guys down in the comment section below. But while you guys do that, come along and listen to me talk to you about my top 10 criteria for backing a crowdfunding game. And these are in no particular order, they just came to my head as I was writing this down. So the first thing that came to my mind, and I mentioned it earlier before, was price. And it's kind of like a weird thing that I have to look at when it comes to price. What I've noticed recently is I like to be told right up front, the very first day when a project goes live, how much everything is going to be in the long run. Like there's different pledge levels and things like that for each one of them, you know, whether you're just getting the base game or the base game plus expansions or base game expansions and you know all these other like crazy like extras and things along that ways. I just want to know right off the hop how much it is to get everything in one shot on day one. I don't need to know what everything is. And I think I mentioned this before when I did my uh, Horror on the Orient Express, why I backed. And I, I, I mean it for this, I meant it for uh, when Massive Universe was out for CMON, and then there's a few other ones that, that happened as well, where there are expansions and things that were announced throughout the course of that particular campaign, and they were awesome, they were great. I was so excited to see all the new stuff and the new things, things along that ways, but on day one, I saw a price, that was the price I clicked at. I mean, mostly I like seeing things that are below 100 bucks. I don't have a lot of money within this, uh, like pool for backing games throughout the year. Um, that's my wife doesn't know about any of that, but she's not gonna watch this, so it's okay. And it's just nice to know right off the hop how much it is in order to get everything because I have major FOMO. Fear of missing out is is a problem of mine. I get it, I know it, it's, it's, I can admit to the problem. It's hard to overcome at times. So if I can see that this is how much everything is going to cost, then in my mind I can start like kind of finagling funds around and figuring out like, all right, this, that, and the other thing. And again, I get why they don't do that because you get like this initial rush of all this money in and then all the stretch goals get beaten and all the things get moved forward really, really fast because everyone's dumping in as much money as possible. You know, first world problems, I guess you can say, right? Uh, but it just, uh, I just, I just really wish that the prices were more upfront going forward on a lot of these uh, crowdfunding projects that I follow. But price will always be important to me. Shipping is a factor. It will always be a factor when it comes to the price. I do live in the United States, so the shipping cost normally for me is never really that bad. It can be worse for a lot of people around the world, you know, whether they're also doing VAT or other type of taxes onto uh, the games that are coming into their countries. But for me, uh, a good solid price that I like to go at is anything under 100. Usually that's a solid, like, all right, I think I can do this. 
from 100 to 150, I'm kind of a little hem and hawing. 150 to 200, it has to be really good. 200 and higher, I have to be really dedicated to the IP, the company. I mean, anybody out there back the Resident Evil sagas or whatever, Resident Evil 2, 3, or 1, those get up really high. And um, yeah, I, I almost don't second guess myself when I uh, put my name down for those. But I know how much it's going to be up front. I have a good idea of how much the entire campaign is going to be in the end. So I can figure it out from there what I am willing to spend in order to get the most out of the game that I'm looking at. Next, I really like solo modes in game. And I'm not just talking about a solo mode that gets unlocked through a stretch goal. I, I do not like those at all because I feel like if you intended for the game to have a solo mode to it, you would have had that incorporated into the main game right at the time when the Kickstarter started or backer kit or whatever, you know, the project would be. It, it I, just, I just I just feel like if somebody says solo mode stretch goal, they're not putting amount of love and attention and like real care into giving that type of mode for the game. And there's a lot of solo gamers out there. Solo board gaming has become very popular lately. I'm part of a group and I, people talk about it all the time. And quite frankly, I, that's how I play. I play mostly solo because my kids are too young to play with me. My wife doesn't really play games. And I see my friend maybe once or twice every other month, give or take or whatever. And when we play, we'll play Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid because we love that game. Every other game that I play, I prefer to have a solo mode so this way I can at least play it for myself and enjoy it that way. And I'm sure there's a lot of other people out there that agree with me as well in terms of having a solo mode. And I'm not even too worried about having true solo modes in some games. I love cooperative games. If it's a cooperative game, I can play it by myself because I'll just play two-handed. I have no issues doing that. Some people do, and I get it and everything. And that's, again, I want to hear all about that down in the comment section below if you guys are curious and interested in talking to me about it. But that's what I want out of a game. I want a one to however many player game to be part of the initial rules and the initial core rule set or whatever before the game even launches wherever they are. Do not tack it on in the middle of a stretch goal because then it's just going to be like, um, yeah, here it is. You can do something or whatever. And, you, blah, 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 you know, completely incoherent, completely uh, nonsensical for the game. It's happened before. I've seen it happen before. And it's really frustrating when that happens because it's just a quick appeal to a group of gamers that really want this type of mode in a game just to be, satisfy them and shut them up and move them on. I'd rather it be something that is focused on and developed in addition to whatever the main game is. So solo modes, one player modes, co-op modes, things along that ways, very, very important to me when I look at a game. Next, I am a sucker for IPs and theme. I love games based around stuff. And you know what? I've been looking on the boards lately and Facebook groups and people talking and whatnot. I actually saw a post uh, the other day, actually, uh, about somebody who's like, I hate themed games, IP games. I prefer original IPs. And I think there was even a video that popped up on my YouTube that kind of discussed that as well. Um, I like seeing that type of stuff incorporated into a game because if I'm familiar with the IP, I'm curious on how it translates to a board game. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. But if that's going to happen, I want the game to fully represent whatever that IP is. For example, I can't remember what the game was that it was a skin of, but The Last of Us had a board game that came out not too long ago. And it was just the last of us, the skin or the, the, the concept of the last of us slapped on top of an already pre-existing board game. And they're trying to sell it off as like, this is the last of us, this is the last of us. But when you actually do the comparison between what it was and what it became, there was no difference at all, except for now you're playing as this character in this game. Uh, yeah, that's the last of us. No, it's not. It's not. It's whatever that original game was. You're playing as last of us characters. It's not a game for that's specifically the last of us, or at least that's not how I saw it anyway. If you're going to use IPs, if you're going to put popular uh, media, whether it be TV shows, cartoons, anime, things along that ways onto a game board, unless it's something like Monopoly or Clue, because the OP does this all the time and they do it fantastic and I love it. Um, <laughs> if you're just some uh, like uh, somebody that's like, I like Wingspan, for example, we'll, we'll make Wingspan and we'll turn it into 
Actually, Papa Roll on his Pokemon. People keep saying you can slap Pokemon onto Wingspan and it would be the same thing. And I can see that. I get it. But the game fundamentally doesn't change at all. You're still playing the same game. You're probably still laying eggs because Pokemon do that and the birds do that in Wingspan. You're still collecting food, whether it be the resources from Wingspan or whatever it is you find in Pokemon. And it's like the, the characters wouldn't do anything. It's just now you're just, instead of seeing a bird, you're seeing a Pikachu or, or whatever like that. So I, that doesn't exist. Real, in, I mean, I, I haven't played in Wormspan yet, but... You know, Pokemon does not exist on top of Wingspan, but I've seen fan creations like that. Great that the fans do it, but if I saw a Kickstarter that tried to sell that, I would not be happy at all. So I love to see uh, my IPs, my themes, my main core concepts of the shows that I like fully represented and fully brought to life within the board games themselves. That to me is, that's, that's a win right there. Next would be more videos. If I am on a campaign and I'm starting to get myself very interested in a game, I want to see more videos. I want to see people play it. I want to see people talk about it. I want to see people show it off. I want to see the components. I want to see how they interact with each other. I'm not asking for every little concept or every little mechanic in the game to be shown off in super detail, but I want to watch people play it. Again, I'm just going to go back because it's the most recent thing on my brain and whatnot. Uh, Horror on the Orient Express. The only reason I really started backing that game is because I watched so many people play it. And then I got the chance to play it on Tabletop Simulator, which you guys probably have seen that already as well. That came out not too long ago on the channel. So I was able to get myself in there and get my hands on it in order to know for a fact that this is the game for me. This is something that I enjoy. There are plenty other games that I followed as well that were like, you should get this. It's awesome. It's great there wasn't really any videos or any of the videos on there were like very, very minuscule how to play videos that were maybe like two, three minutes long that didn't show too much of the game or didn't give too many details and whatnot. You can go through the Kickstarter page and read like, you know, up on it and whatnot and they can tell you certain things, but I like seeing it in action. I'm a visual learner and I want to watch somebody play and I want to hear how they play as well. Listening to a person play a game to me is just as exciting as watching it because it's their energy, it's their excitement, it's their enthusiasm. That's what I like to give to you guys whenever I play. These are the type of things that I want to see somebody have when they play a game because it gets me excited and then I'm like, okay, I can see where this is fun, I can see where this is great. It's starting to sell me more and more. If it's a boring playthrough or a boring person sitting there just nonchalantly walking through every step of the rule book, I don't care anymore. I really don't. I need excitement. I need enjoyment. I need to see them loving what it is that they have in front of them. And there are Kickstarters out there that I think need more videos like that to really sell their game. And if you have somebody out there that has played it for you, that whether they played it on TTS or they managed to get an early copy and whatnot, and it's not on your Kickstarter page, put it on the page. Get it out there. Give the creator the, uh, the, the the recognition that they have in order to show off your game. You know, the more people that have played it, the more interest you're going to get from people because I know a lot of other viewers out there love seeing uh, games in action before they buy. And then, of course, playing it for yourself. I think more companies need to put demos on TTS for somebody to play. This way, you know for sure this is the game that you want. And finally, one of my big things is having an engaging campaign, being able to sit there and be very excited every single day that you just want to keep checking your Kickstarter or GameFound or whatever, see where the funds are, see what's been unlocked, see what's coming up next. I need daily updates from the publishers. I think that is a fantastic thing to do as well, even if it's something small, something along just the lines of, hey, we're hitting this goal. This looks to be something that you can look forward to in the future. This is what we're going to be doing for you guys soon. You know, I, I mean, everyone loves free stuff. Let's, let's, not, let's not get that wrong. You love your stretch goals. You love your daily reveals. You love seeing your money go even further. Just going back to part number one or uh, number one that I had on this list, um, where as more stretch goals are being revealed and more daily reveals are happening, that your money's like, oh, just uh, I get that too? Oh, I get that too? That's awesome, that's awesome, that's awesome. In addition to that, if other YouTubers or whatever happen to gain access to the game that's on this Kickstarter, whether it be on 
TTS or they're playing it from, you know, somebody that got a free copy of Letting Them Play or whatever, and they put out a video, put it right there in the daily reminders or the daily uh, updates, and then get it onto the Kickstarter itself. You know, the daily updates are a great way for people to actually see what's new, what's exciting, and what they can expect going further from a campaign that you normally wouldn't be able to see if you just go right into the main page and not have to scroll through everything. You can also go into the comments section to look at people as well. I love seeing uh, the actual producers and designers and everything in the comments section of Kickstarters and GameFounds and everything like that, interacting with all of the fans. Some of the best campaigns that I have ever seen and ever been a part of were ones where those uh, people from the production company, you know, the, the designers, production, the things, the, whatever, are there in the comments talking to people, listening to people, seeing all of the suggestions, and then kind of molding their campaign around what it is that the people want. So this way they can go in and feel satisfied, obviously, about what it is that they buy. Those are the best ones I've ever seen. I've seen the flip side, too, where I've watched the campaign that I thought I was going to be interested in. I ended up canceling my uh, reservation on it, um, or whatever it was, the... Uh, uh, my, my, my pledge on it or whatever, um, simply because they were just, the game itself wasn't that great. The developers were awful. Uh, no one was responding to anybody and anybody that did some type of respond from the company ended up being all like a, Oh, poor us story. It was, it was a mess. And I, I hung around to watch and just see how it all ended up or whatever. And it, they succeeded in it, but it was way lower than it should have been to be honest with you. It was just very disappointing to see that campaign end the way it did because it had so much potential. And I'm not going to give anything away. That's I've already said too much. But a lot of the more recent campaigns that I've seen where there's interaction between the people on the other side of, uh, you know, the, the shop and uh, talking to or whatever, the um, not the shop. Other side of the desk, we'll say that. Well, the people on the other side of the desk, the production company or whatever, uh, seeing the people, talking to them and letting them know that you are in the right place, that we are listening to you, that we are trying to make this the best we can for you. Those are some of the best, best, best campaigns I've ever been a part of. And I'm very happy to be included in that. So anyway, there you have it, everyone. Those were my five basic top things that I look for when I go into a crowdfunding project, the criteria that I have to hit. Now, it doesn't always work out this way. There's a lot of times when <laughs> some of these top fives don't even make it on the list, like the pricing goes a little wonky, or I'll buy something that does not have a solo mode, but there's just something about it that I absolutely enjoy that I, I is, is drawing me to it. Those are like the exception to the rules and everything. And they're few and far between, but they are out there. These are more like I say they're criteria, but they're really more like guidelines than everything else. But regardless of anything, I'd love to hear, again, what you think down in the comment section below. I'd love to keep this conversation going and hearing about all of your experiences as well through your crowdfunding projects. Uh, there's, there's so much coming out over the next few months that I really wanted to make this video to just kind of give myself a little bit more of a perspective on when I go into these crowdfunding projects to not just blindly hit the button and be like, mine, 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 to really take the time to really think about it and really analyze, can I get this game? Will I put, you know, will I be able to use it? Will I be able to play it a lot? Will it become a staple within my collection for who knows how long? I mean, ideally, whenever I get a game, I would love to play with my sons one day long time away from that, but hey, you never know. Thank you guys again for joining me on this family meeting as we talk about crowdfunding projects and your bullet points for wanting to be able to back one of these projects. Again, just let me know everything down in the comment section below. There's going to be, again, many things coming out in the future. So in order not to miss any more family meetings or reasons about why I back various projects, be sure you are subscribed to The Home Gamer Dad. Let me know some of the projects that you're looking forward to as well, because not that I need any more on my list, but I wouldn't mind checking them out as well. Uh, if you wish to support the channel even further, there are ways to do that down in the description section below. YouTube memberships, Patreon, things along that ways. But in all honesty, your view, your like, your comment, your shares goes a long way in or helping the channel all the time. Uh, again, these family meetings are mostly about just us getting together and talking and chatting and just 
going back and forth, responding to your comments, other people responding to different comments and things along that way. I, I think we can have a really cool conversation with this, maybe learn something too, or at least get ourselves in a different mindset going forward to try to help us, you know, narrow down what games we really, really want compared to those that we may just buy on a whim, which I have done before as well. You have all been amazing. Thank you once again. We are family forever gaming together. Video portion of this family meeting is adjourned. I will see you down in the comments and then I will also see you in the next video. You guys take care and I will see you then. Later everyone.